Sattvik, myself, Mohit. And now, our father and the director of the play, Mr. Sudesh Sharma. On music, we have Ginni. Scotland. We have a third person joining in for this discussion, Ms. Dipanjana Pal, who is a journalist and the author of The Painter, a biography of the Indian artist Raja Ravi Verma. A student of English and post-colonial literature, she writes about art, literature, cinema, and other facets of contemporary culture. Dipanjana's writing has appeared in a variety of publications, including Wallpaper, Caravan, Mint Lounge, Vogue, and Business Standard. At present, she is a senior editor with the news website First Post. She is based in Mumbai. Ms. Panjana Pal would provide her perspective to the book Patna Rafkat. We request Mr. Jerry Pintu, Mr. Siddharth Chaudhary, and Ms. Dipanjana Pal to kindly come on the dais for their discussion on the book Patna Rafkat. True fact, observation, a quiet, uh, almost introspective gaze. Um, so I thought I'd ask Siddharth, was that a hard one tone because for me I often feel the tone of a book is almost the most important thing and then followed of course by the rhythm of it and we'll come to that later so let's deal with the tone one of the things I work very uh, hard uh, upon is the tone and uh, for Patna Rafkat, uh, Patna Rafkat is uh, of a world uh, which is uh, upper class. Um, the world in Day Scholar, which we talked about yesterday, is uh, uh, slightly uh, uh, maybe lower middle class. And this, so the tone in that book and the book uh, itself is different. But in Patna Rafkat, uh, we, uh, we are talking, uh, uh, most of the characters are very uh, well educated. Uh, e even when they are not edu uh, educated, they do come from a background which has had education uh, in the past. And uh, though maybe they are not rich enough anymore, uh, there's a, a shabby gentility to their lives. but there is that other, and there is that maybe quietness and a slowness, uh, which I also talk about in uh, Patna, and that I wanted in the tone when I was uh, writing it. So there are um, uh, sections in the book which do change in uh, tone in the sense that once in a while uh, there would be uh, uh, a, a story which is maybe breathless in quality, which is probably the, the first one called Kadam Kumar Patna, where I introduce most of the characters. Um, and there would be a, a story which is at the end, a long story called Waiting for Godard, which you saw a bit reenacted, but I, I felt the, uh, they did a very admirable job, but I, uh, the tone was probably not right, because the tone of Waiting for Godard it is uh, much more contemplative, much more quieter, and uh, uh, these are two very educated people. So uh, these are the things which I kind of w work upon. And but you I know, know. Um, uh, Siddharth, I'm asking on the, in the, at the level of the artisanal, in the sense that when you're looking at a sentence, yes. when you're constructing a sentence, yes. how do you ensure that uh, the tone remains the same. I mean, let's just talk about, you wrote the book, now what is the process by which you edit it? Because you're also an editor in your work life. Right. So, yeah. uh, does that, do those, sorry, does that set of skills play into the writing, uh, the writer, Siddharth Chaudhary? Well, uh, some, but you know, I, I'm an editor of academic books, which is a totally uh, different uh, uh, ball game in, in a way. But in writing, what I kind of do is, uh, I do many drafts, like uh, my, uh, probably my first draft uh, of, uh, I, I like to block out scenes and uh, m maybe a whole uh, kind of a narrative. 
uh, and the first draft would be like a skeleton. It would be like maybe 2,000 words, maybe 1,500 words, uh, which will just have the bare thing of the story written probably in a, a day or two. Then I'll go back to it maybe after 15, 20 days or a month and rewrite it. Um, and then it would probably become 3,000 words. And then again rewrite it. And this process uh, probably will go on for five or six uh, times. And then I'll type it out. You mean this, is, uh, this really sounds like a kind of organic growth process? Kind of like, yes. Because th in those, uh, uh, the first draft, absolutely I uh, write in fright almost that, you know, I, uh, I would lose the story. But once that is done, I'm much more calmer. And then I keep adding things. I keep looking at it, uh, uh, keep adding details, connections, uh, a bit of social commentary, which I like to do. Uh, politics and so those are the accumulated things which then actually becomes the story and this yeah, is but what you know, I and that's very interesting because also if you're looking at uh, if I'm when we I was reading Patna Rafkat last night and in those startling first pages there are at least three tonal register changes so the first is as I said the aphorismic and almost laid back elegances of dreams are like glassware then comes our introduction to the character where he's talking about himself yes. almost as if he is writing a profile of himself. Right. Yeah. It's almost as though he's being a journalist. Yeah. Uh, that being a journalist, he will now set up the character. And then there's this sudden, almost uh, unprecedented leap into another space, which is the dead body in Golghar yes. with the yeah. rat. Uh, piss around it yes. and the folded up marriage certificate, the botched suicide, which we don't understand and we are left yes. to not understand. Now, we're in this organic growth process, which almost seems to me like growing cultures in a laboratory, you know, just watching <laughs> generations kind of, like, yes. of bacteria Definitely. emerge. Yeah? Yeah. Um, where does something, how do you fit these three things together? Um. Okay, I'm, what I'm asking is, yeah. when these three things occur one after the other, yes. have they always occurred one after the other, Not or always. have they been rejigged? They're almost always rejigged. They're almost uh, always uh, rejigged, and uh, I, I uh, uh, you see, uh, you really can't predict. Uh, I really don't know when I'm starting it out where my mind will go, and I try to. Uh, uh, I never second guess my intuition. I, I just write it out. And um, usually it works. Usually no, it no, works. You're it, now it, talking it, about that first draft, the first 1,500 words. E e e even, even the later ones. Yeah, but that's fascinating now because actually when you said you had your first draft, right. I got In fact, the the, sometimes the tone totally changes from the first to the third draft. Okay. And Great, because yeah. I, you know, I, was, I was wondering whether that first draft is ever a constriction. Where you feel, oh, oh, I, I said I would do this. No, no, the first draft is uh, not a construction. It's more of like a, uh, a burden of my chest, in a way, that, you know, I've got this done, and it's there, so I can go back to it anytime I want. And then I uh, work more freely. Um, and, you know, I, w I would just keep looking at it, uh, just add a paragraph here, a paragraph uh, there, and uh, again, in the and it can go anywhere. It can go anywhere, and uh, I would go with the flow basically. But it's only after the fourth or fifth draft that I I would know that you know okay fine I have the basic story now, and then I would put in the timing of the sentences right and work on the timing, the rhythm uh, of everything. Okay, so Fitur ki baat kare. Yesterday you were talking about how. Uh, I think uh, in the conversation with Trisha Gupta, you <coughs> talked about how you just go with, with a certain, uh, uh, like a will-o'-the-wisp that's leading you off into another, into a, into a digression, perhaps. Right. Now, yeah. I'm always fascinated by digressions because we've had uh, Kiran Nagarkar in the morning, yes. who talked about asides, you yeah. know, and his asides are set aside in Ravan and Eddie. He actually labels them. He sets them aside and says, about the water wars of Bombay, or about Afghan snow, the beauty product of the 70s. The and he sets it clearly aside. Whereas your, uh, your, 
your digressions are organic. They're again kind of like wandering paths yeah. that, you know, it seems as if you've almost just wandered off your main stream and then you're coming back again to it. Uh, that's the uh, kind of storytelling I uh, like to do and I like to read. And I like uh, this thing that, you know, uh, I can kind of jump from any cliff and uh, try and uh, try to land uh, safely. Sometimes I don't, but I would uh, always jump off that cliff. So I try to do that, and uh, my thing is that uh, always try to entertain the uh, reader, and I, I, if I see the pace slackening or something, I would try to do uh, uh, something different. So uh, digressions, are, I feel add to my uh, uh, novels a lot. And there, uh, I, I do a, a bit of ax grinding. I do uh, whatever I need to say about many things. Um, uh, because in my own uh, 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 private life, I'm not much of a uh, political uh, person in the sense that I would go over and join something, uh, go. Uh, uh, join a party or you know do that but but when i write th that's when i kind of engage with the public in a way so it's interesting that's, because yeah. you know uh, there are two uh, two wonderfully contradictory things that you just said which is one is uh, to entertain the public yes. which suggests that at its worst let me say yeah. that the uh, the readers um, sensibility must never be offended because to entertain someone, you must stay within the bounds of what they would consider entertaining. Whereas to grind an axe is yeah. actually to, to do some axe grinding, might be grinding an axe on their sensibilities. But well, as we know from, uh, as we know from uh, news media and debates today, they're pretty much the same thing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, where our news media has become entertainment, yeah. achieved entirely from offense. But... Um, uh, what you were saying about these two contradictions, that a lot of your fiction is so much about contradictions constantly playing off. Characters who are contradictory, yeah. tonalities that seem contradictory to the setting that they're in. Like this, in Patna Rafkat, the kind of, um, the genteelness right, uh, yes. that you're talking about, it's not something that is, let's say, stereotypically associated with Bihar. Uh, true, but you know, uh, but that is what I know. I mean, that is uh, that is the reality. Though I mean, only the bad things about Bihar uh, in in the 90s would uh, get uh, you know publicized. But you you see, I I grew up in that place, and to me, it was a fine enough place to grow up in. And I still uh, uh, do not think that you know maybe if I had grown up uh, maybe in Delhi or Bombay, uh, my life would have been better or uh, something like that. It, I felt it was a wonderful place to uh, grow up in, and and it, uh, it's it's not a fantasy, which uh, what I'm uh, uh, writing about. You know, but I uh, what the sense that I get, <laughs> and it is a sense of it's an interesting sense is that you in both these there are islands of people. Yeah. That uh, Patna Rafkat is constructed of an island of. People who have been drawn together almost by osmosis. So Harida, Sanyalda, uh, you, uh, you know, the, uh, the central yeah. character. They come together because of a perceived sense yeah. of common, um, I don't know whether it's intellectual, but it is no, or even mental, but it is kind of almost like they are kindred spirits. But and it, that it, they will the be different from each other and it's often... The, it, it, it's, it's it's the mohalla milieu basically, Very true. Uh, uh, the neighborhood, uh, and you know in a in a mohalla you tend to know many people who may not be of your same class, uh, but they are your friends. You know it's uh, it's a much more uh, intrusive and a much more closer closer knit kind of a place where you would know about uh, families and things uh, going back generations and um, you know. Uh, People who have grown up together on the same streets, uh, uh, basically. So uh, that's the kind of thing I wanted to capture, and I uh, worked at it. But of course, uh, there are parts of uh, uh, Patna Rafkat uh, 
which, uh, you know, the tone changes. Uh, there is a love story which is, uh, uh, in a way, uh, much more restrained and uh, 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 different from the world which is first introduced in uh, uh, Kadam Kumar Patna. And, you know, so, and I think these uh, d uh, different uh, uh, stories uh, t told from different uh, viewpoints add to a kind of a world. And the, uh, though it's a very slim book, if you had notice it, uh, it goes for almost uh, it, 40, 45 years. You know, the span of the, of, of the uh, novel. And um, so, in a way, in Patna Rafkat, I try to do many things. And whatever was there in my mind, and it's a, also a, a book about books. It's a, a, a book about uh, writers, the uh, writing life. And um, so all these things, my love for cinema, everything came into uh, uh, the book. And so I kind of like uh, put in everything in the cauldron, in, in a way. Uh, you know, so I was wondering about this because you tell, uh, yesterday you said that it's the Patna Manual of Style, which is the third book, which I love. As a, as a title, I think it's a magnificent title. And I'm always, uh, you know, I wonder whether this is kind of as if there's a Bildungs Roman here that is being stretched out over three, pay, three books. Not stretched out, but is being worked out over three books. Because in some sense, Patna Rafkat is also a very slim, yes. very economical and elegantly taught Bildungsroman in itself. Uh, yes, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, some of the... Uh, uh, it would be connected. It would be connected. But uh, it, uh, the book would... Kick, uh, all the books uh, can be read on their own. And uh, you see, uh, many of the characters uh, which are there in Patna Rafkat have also been uh, there in my first book, in Dikshats and Martins. Uh, there are, f I think, four or five Ritwik and Meera stories there. And uh, there are a couple of guys who are named Hridayas. So I keep going back to the same stories in a way. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, I felt that, uh, I feel that maybe Diksha is kind of like a blueprint of whatever work I'll do probably in the future or things like that.